you and me and the three boys and Cheryl at the cottage, even Grandpa's in the picture. It's before oxygen. Maybe next year we'll be back with no oxygen. Uh, hopefully. Maybe next year. But weeks after we first met Brian, he remains largely tethered to oxygen tanks he cannot live without. I increase my oxygen up to 10 liters. I'm normally on 8 liters. That gives me a little bit extra to exercise with. And struggles to maintain a level of health he will need for the physical stress of surgery. I just go until I get out of breath and I stop. Wait for my oxygen to recover. But movement isn't the only element in this battle. Do you have something to eat for lunch? I haven't eaten lunch yet, no. I haven't been this skinny since I got out of the police academy. Got to put a little weight on you. Transplant is an intimate struggle for everyone who cares about the patient. She's my rock. He'd do the same for me. I couldn't do it without her. He'd do the same for me. And then you hit Brian's me. wife, Jane, remains glued to the UNO site. I look at it every day just because I waiting for the day that we get this transplant. There's 52 people waiting for lungs. I want him to be number one because I want the phone call, but then I realize there's people sicker than him, and I realize there's people that's less sicker that are gonna have to wait longer. So it's a system to make it fair that just because you're rich or you're important, you're not gonna, he's gonna get his lung because he's on the list and that's when he's supposed to get his lung. Patient care and, and research. Dr. Stefan Tullius, Chief of Transplant Surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Transplantation is unique because it's not the one single moment uh, where something happens and then one loses contact with uh, the patient. It is really the long-term relationship. For us, it is equally a burden to see that uh, patients would not reach the time point when they are going to get a transplant. On average, more than 20 people will die every day waiting, while just one donor can save as many as eight lives and help many more in need of healing tissue. The number of available donors falls far short of the need. And when it comes to lungs, 80% of organs that are donated are not viable. But there is one area of increase, a byproduct of the opioid crisis Brian has signed up to receive from a once unlikely donor pool. We're in the process of completing a, a trial looking at taking lungs from donors that have hepatitis C and, and using them for transplant and managing that in the recipient. In the past, we would just exclude all of those donors automatically, but now they make up such a large percentage of the possible donor pool that if we excluded them, then there's a lot of people that are waiting for organs that wouldn't get transplanted. Well, doctors work to increase the value of organs and long-term outlook. We would want to treat our patients in a way that we have the one organ for life for a lifetime and we are not there yet they hold in high regard every organ they do receive now all of a sudden you you see this donor and the relevance uh, of it and you value this gift you now as the surgeon uh, uh, also in a different uh, way and screen patients carefully the organs survival just as important as the patients we would not move forward if we would not think that a patient is going to be compliant. So breathe out and in. For Brian, the reality of uncertainty, every breath is another minute closer to transplant, but also a realization that time may run out. I'm happy I've gone as far as I have. I look at the people I know that aren't here. And I think that uh, I've lived a good life. I have friends that never saw 60. So that, that always weighs in the back of my mind that I had that much more time than they did. <laughs>